Good morning, and welcome to the Catholic community of Pleasanton. I see a lot of familiar faces, for we gather today as a family to celebrate someone special. Juliana was and always will be a part of this church family. And today we lift her up in song and in prayer. So before we begin, I'd like to ask all of you to please check your cell phones. Make sure they're turned off or silenced, and that way we can make sure that we are all fully present during this special time together. Thank you. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the love of God, the grace and peace of our risen Lord Jesus Christ, and the consolation of the Holy Spirit be with you. And with your spirit. My dear brothers and sisters, we gather on this day in the season of Easter to pray for our sister Juliana as we celebrate her life this day. And I know that as much as we like to use the word, it can seem like an odd word to use on a day like today to say celebrate when we're so aware of our loss. But for those of us who believe in the risen Lord Jesus Christ, there is a sense of joy to this day that Juliana's journey on this world has ended and she's returned to the one who gave her breath to begin with. She's found her way home to God. And so we begin this day here near the doors of the church to recall that moment when Juliana entered into the life of faith through the great gift, the great sacrament of baptism. Um, there's actually many symbols around us today to remind us of that very significant moment in her life so many years ago in Budapest. Um, in the very center of the church, where Juliana soon will be, there's a very large candle standing there with flowers at its base. That candle is our Easter candle, the Paschal candle, the light of the risen Christ that was lit for the very first time just two weeks ago at the high mass of the year, the great vigil of Easter. It is for us the light of the risen Christ, and it would have been from a candle something like that that her baptismal candle was lit when she was given the light of faith to guide her in her life. On a day when normally we would dress in black as a sign of our loss and mourning, the church asked me to wear white as a sign of the new life that Juliette has entered into. And of course, on her baptismal day, she would have been dressed in white. And in just a moment, we will cover her with white again as a symbol of that. And on that day, there was that great use of water, holy water, that God has used throughout all time to represent his work among us, whether it was in um, freeing the children of Israel through the waters of the Red Sea, or whether it was uh, how the Spirit hovered over the waters of creation, bringing forth all life, or how even in the Jordan River, Jesus himself was baptized. We do this as a remembrance of how baptism makes an end to evil, fills us with the Spirit, and gives us new life. As St. Paul says in the letter to the Romans, are you unaware that all of us who have been baptized have been baptized into the death of Christ, so that we might enter into his resurrection. So what began so many years ago for Juliana in baptism, we believe has reached its, if not logical, at least theological conclusion in her being welcomed to eternal life. In baptism, Juliana died with Christ. May she rise with him to new and everlasting life. Amen. Amen. And come, let us go to the altar of the Lord. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people. I will 
will make their darkness bright? Who will bend my light to them? Who shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling. those of you I've not yet had the pleasure of meeting, I'm Father Mark Wiesner. I'm pastor of the Catholic Community of Pleasanton. I'm very honored to be with you today to celebrate Juliana's life and to pray for her. This woman who was part of this community for so long in her life, in her ministry, even to the very end of her life, sharing in prayer with us by joining us on our live webcast. So I would also like to welcome all those who are watching our webcast today. Thank you for being with us wherever you may be in the world and for praying with us today. Um, we know you are there, and you're very much part of this community. Indeed, welcome to all of you. I know moments like this bring all kinds of people together with all kinds of faith backgrounds. There are some here today who might not be Catholic or even Christian, some who may have no faith life at all, maybe the first time you ever walked into a church, as well as those who, like Juliana, the faith is central to your life. Um, wherever you are on that spectrum, it is so good to have you here today. Uh, we have this in common in the least, and that is we are Juliana's community. We're her family, we're her friends, and it's good that we're here together today. And as we gather today, there's several things we're going to do. All of them are sacred and all of them are holy. Many of them are probably things that you've been doing since you heard about Juliana's passing at the end of March. Just we come together as a community today and we do them together, and there is something sacred about that. I mean, obviously today, we remember Juliana. How can we not, right? Um, Rob will later in the service share something about his mother with us, and there's no doubt you carry your own memories close to heart of this wonderful woman. Uh, remembering is very sacred, and it is very holy. And sometimes we can forget how powerful it is because in our busy lives, we often think if I get through my checklist of things to do, then I've remembered everything and I've had a good day. And it's such a shallow idea of memory. For um, the Jewish people who lived thousands of years ago at the time of Jesus, who didn't have the wonders that we have, like you know, pictures to hold in their hands of the people they loved or videos or anything to remember people by, all they had was memory. And for them, they believed when you remembered someone, in that very act of remembering, that person lived for you again. And it's kind of hard to illustrate, but it's really easy to give you an example of. 
I invite you in the quiet of your heart right now to simply remember Juliana. Call her to mind. Maybe a favorite moment you shared with her. Uh, maybe a running joke you had with her. Um, maybe you can simply remember her voice, her accent, the sound of her laughter. Maybe you can recall a very wise word she spoke to at the moment you needed to hear it. Or maybe a very wise word she spoke to when you didn't want to hear it, but needed it all the same. When you remember things, whether it's a handshake, an embrace, her laughter, what happens is whether you're remembering something from two months ago or 20 years ago, the time drops right out and it lives for you again. You can laugh at the jokes. You can hear her voice. You can feel her hand in your hand. You can be comforted or challenged by her words again. Truly, memory keeps someone present to us. Jesus knew that, right? Because the night before he died, he said, take bread, take wine, remember me, keep me present. And we'll do that today as well. So we remember. Another sacred thing we do today is we mourn. Someone who's very important to you, someone who might have been part of your life since the moment you had first had consciousness, is no longer here in the way that you are used to her being here. And that can physically hurt. And tears are a very holy response. I know outside of here, sometimes we feel like we've got to look like we've got it all put together no matter what's happening in our life. But even Jesus, the Lord of life, wept when his friend Lazarus passed away. Why we think we're not supposed to mourn, I have no idea. But at least here today, it's safe to mourn. If you need to cry, cry. If you need to laugh, laugh. If you need to sleep, sleep. I won't be offended. I know what mourning does. We each mourn differently, and it's all sacred and holy. And among everything else we do, we pray. That is to say, we bring our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength into the presence of God, however it is that we understand God. And we ask God's blessing not only upon Juliana, but upon all who've known this loss. In essence, in the spirit, we go as far as we can today, journeying with Juliana, and we leave her in the faith of God's loving arms. And so, let us pray. O oh God, who through the ending of present things open up the beginning of things to come, grant, we pray, that the soul of your servant Juliana may be led by you to attain the inheritance of eternal redemption. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Whenever we come to important moments in our lives, such as this one, the church always has us turn to the scriptures to hear what God would speak in this moment. Uh, it can be very easy to forget, that is to say, not remember, not keep alive for ourselves, what God has said about this very significant moment. So I invite Rob to come forward to proclaim our first reading today. A reading from the book of Ecclesiastes. There is an appointed time for everything, a time for every affair under the heavens, a time to give birth and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot the plant, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to be far from embraces. Sorry. A time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away a time to rend and a time to sow, 
a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. What profit have workers from their toll, toil? I have seen the business that God has given to be busy about. God has made everything appropriate to its time. I recognize that there is nothing better than to rejoice and to do well during life. Moreover, that all can eat and drink and enjoy the good of all their toil. This is a gift of God. I recognize that whatever God does will endure forever. There's no adding to it or taking from it. Thus has God done that he may be revered. What now is has already been. What is to be already is. God retrieves what has gone by. The word of the Lord. Shepherd me, O oh God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death into life. Shepherd me, O oh God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death into life. God is my shepherd, so nothing shall I want. I rest in the meadows of faithfulness and love. I walk by the quiet waters of peace. Shepherd me, O oh God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death into life. Though I should wander the valley of death, I fear no evil, for you are at my side. Your rod and your staff, my comfort and my hope. Shepherd me, O oh God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death into life. kindness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of my God forevermore. Shepherd me, O oh God, beyond my wants beyond my fears, from death into life. Unfortunately, Stephanie was not feeling well today, so I'd like to invite her husband, Justin, to come forward to proclaim our second reading today from Paul's letter to the Corinthians.
Good morning. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Strive eagerly for the greatest spiritual gifts. If I speak in human and angelic tongues, but do not have love, I am a resounding gong or a clashing cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and comprehend all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away everything I owned, if I hand my body over so that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love is not pompous. It is not inflated. It is not rude. It does not seek its own interests. It is not quick-tempered. It does not brood over injury. It does not rejoice over wrongdoing but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. If there are prophecies, they will be brought to nothing. If tongues, they will cease. If knowledge, it will be brought to nothing. For we know partially and we prophesy partially. But when perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I used to talk as a child, think as a child, reason as a child. When I became a man, I put aside childish things. At present, we see indistinctly, as in a mirror, but then face to face. At present, I know partially, then I shall know fully, as I am fully known. So faith, hope, love remain, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Thank you. Please stand to greet the gospel. Reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders who heard it said, Look, he is calling Elijah. One of them ran, soaked a sponge with wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see if Elijah comes to take him down. Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. The veil of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who stood facing him saw how he breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Very early when the sun had risen on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb. They were saying to one another, who will roll back the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. On entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a white robe, and they were utterly amazed. He said to them, Do not be amazed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated.
How are you doing? Yeah, it's okay not to be okay, as I often tell people on a day like today. It really is. It's, not, it's a very, very hard day. Um, and so just know we're here with you, and whatever needs to happen, just let it happen. Um, I found in my, you know, I'm pushing 29 years as a priest now, that these are usually some of the most difficult but most beautiful moments in my priesthood. Um, people who have lost someone they truly care about, who truly cared about them. And it's a difficult moment, it's a beautiful moment, it's a holy moment. And somehow, I always feel like in the next few minutes I'm supposed to say something that sort of changes everything. And um, I don't know if I can do that. You know, I mean, because it's hard. It just is. I'll, I'll be right up front and honest with you. I've been trying to remember if I ever met Juliana, and I'm sure I did, probably coming and going from Mass. I mean, you gave me some talking points about her life, and everybody who I've encountered who know her tells what a wonderful woman she was. I know she did sort of plan the Mass for us, picked readings and music and things, and I'm here because she requests that I be here because she used to watch me online and she liked what I did. So apparently she was a woman of exquisite taste. So, um, and there it is. Laughter in a moment like this is a great sign of Christian hope that despite what has happened, we know it's not the end. I reflect upon the fact that uh, while I didn't know Juliana, I know the faith that informed her life and what it is that brings us here today. And that is simply this, that despite what has happened and what brings us together today, this is not the end. It's not the last time we will be together. For God, in the resurrection of Jesus that we keep in this Easter season, has shown us that there's something beyond this moment. Um, that's why it's important to remember what God has spoken to us. Because if we don't, we can lose hope. I mean, I know, as I mentioned at the beginning of our service, in our world and our society where we are fearful to talk about death, we like to call this a celebration of life, not just a funeral mass. And that's fine, and that's important. To remember Juliana and her life and all the wonderful things she did and the incredible person she was. But I think the problem with keeping a celebration of life is that it just causes us to look back at the person and who they were. And the memories might bring laughter, the memories might bring tears, the memories might bring comfort, the memories might bring a sense of loss. But it keeps us on that life. Whereas we are a people who look forward with hope. Not only do we celebrate her life, but we celebrate perhaps even more so what God is doing in this moment for Juliana and for all who have gone before us. And that is this, that God in the resurrection of Jesus has revealed that death does not get the last word, but that rather God gets the last word. And God's last word is always, always a word of love, a word that brings us to life. Can I prove that? not in the way you might want to have proof. You know, as a, as a society that depends so much on our science and our technology and our knowledge, I can't exactly wheel out a whiteboard, put up a theorem that shows you equivoc unequivocally that love will bring us to life. I can't do some experiment in front of you to prove that. But at the same time, I'm willing to bet that the experience of love bringing life to us is not beyond any of our experience, that we all in our life have had those moments when we know what love does for us that can't be proved scientifically, but is an experience that tells us this is true. I mean, for example, you could argue that all of us are here today precisely because of love, the love between a man and a woman that generates life, because that's what love does. Or, some of you heard me share before, my favorite example of love. Not the love that is the sort of, I love Christmas, or I love Star Wars, or I love chocolate, as wonderful as all those are. But the real experience of love, when it sweeps in out of the blue, 
sometimes unexpectedly, and knocks you head over heels off your chair onto your butt kind of love, that kind of love. If you have never experienced that kind of love, I highly recommend it. It's one of the most fantastic experiences of being human. First time it happened to me, I was a freshman in high school. So a long time ago, no scandal happening here. It's just, this was going way back. I was at De La Salle High School, and I was a freshman. She was a sophomore. Her name was Carla. She was Latina. She had long brown hair, and Carla was a dancer. And when love came in out of the blue and knocked me head over heels onto my butt, looking back on it now, I can confidently say that the only word I would use to describe myself at that point in my life was absolutely and completely pathetic. <laughs> That's what happened. I don't think I walked anywhere for a couple of weeks. I think I skipped or hopped everywhere I was going. And I know, I know that I was humming and singing everywhere I went, right? So freshman in high school, skipping, humming, singing, not cool, didn't care because something about love had happened in my life. But in all honesty, what I really remember is at that time, suddenly, the sky actually looked bluer than it ever looked before. And the air smelled fresher and the grass looked greener. Falling in love brought me more to life than I'd ever been before, because that's what love does. You know, we're not so silly as to think that God needs Father Mark, or God needs this, or God needs anything. God is love, complete in and of God's self, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But because God is love, here's a cosmos for you. Because that's what love does. It generates life. And that experience of love that we've all had, I think can inform this day for us. That love of God which is so beyond our understanding and without condition and without limits and beyond our dreaming. That kind of love brings a life that is so beyond our understanding and so without condition and so without limits and so beyond our dreaming. I don't think we even begin to grasp what it is that Julian has been invited into, all who have gone before have invited into, a reality more real than this one is, right? St. Paul writes somewhere that, I has not seen, ear has not heard what God has ready for those who love him. We use words for it. Resurrection, glorification, ascension, so we can get a handle, at least talk about it. But what that is, Someone once said it's like trying to smell the color nine. Nine's not a color and you can't smell it. It's so beyond our ability to comprehend. But we've been told, it's been revealed in the season of Easter, the truth of that. So, if we can believe that, or even just want to believe that, we're in good stead. Because then, while we may mourn, we don't give in to hopelessness. And while we may grieve, we don't give in to despair because we trust love more than our loss and look forward to the day when God will gather us together again in his kingdom where there will be no more tears and no more sorrow. Then we'll be okay. Please stand. And at this time, I'd like to invite Christopher to come forward to help lead us in prayer today. Christopher has several petitions, each which end with the words, we pray to the Lord. And I invite you to respond, Lord, hear our prayer. My dear brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and sits at the right hand of God the Father, where he intercedes for us, his church. 
confident that God hears the voices of those who trust in the Lord Jesus, we join our prayer to his. The response is, Lord, hear our prayer. In baptism, Juliana received the light of Christ. Scatter the darkness now and lead her over the waters of death. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Our sister Juliana was nourished at the table of the Savior. Welcome her into the halls of the heavenly banquet. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Many friends and members of our families have gone before us and await the kingdom. Grant them an everlasting home with your son. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Those who trusted in the Lord now sleep in the Lord. Give refreshment, rest, and peace to all whose faith is known to you alone. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. The family and friends of Juliana seek comfort and consolation. Heal their pain and dispel the darkness and doubt that comes from grief. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We are assembled here in faith and confidence to pray for Juliana. Strengthen our hope so that we may live in the expectation of your son's coming. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord God, giver of peace and healer of souls, hear the prayers of the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, and the voices of your people whose lives were purchased by the blood of the Lamb. Forgive the sins of all who sleep in Christ and grant them a place in your kingdom. We ask this as we do all things through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We now come to the altar of the Lord and we do as Jesus asked us to do. We take bread, we take wine, and we remember him. And we believe he's present with us in our remembering in a very unique way. The prayer that I'm about to lead is several thousand years old. We call it our Eucharistic prayer. And you may have heard before that the word Eucharist means thanksgiving or to give thanks. This is our great prayer of thanksgiving, and certainly for the great gift of Juliana, we all have reason to be grateful this day. You shall cross the barren desert, but you shall not die of thirst. You shall
Please stand and pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Look favorably on our offerings, O Lord, so that your departed servant, Juliana, may be taken up into glory with your Son, in whose great mystery of love we are all united through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just. Our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. In Him, the hope of blessed resurrection has dawned, that those saddened by the certainty of dying might be consoled by the promise of immortality to come. Indeed, for your faithful Lord, life is changed, not ended. And when this earthly dwelling turns to dust, an eternal dwelling is made ready for them in heaven. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. Are indeed holy, O Lord, the font of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts we pray by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The Mystery of Faith. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that, partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, and Michael, our bishop, and all the clergy. Remember your servant Juliana, whom you have called from this world to yourself. Grant that she, who was united with your son in a death like his, may also be one with him in his resurrection. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, 
with the blessed apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, formed divine, by divine teaching, we dare to pray the prayer that Christ himself taught us, the prayer that Juliana prayed herself so many times throughout her life, even in this very building. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, you who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And may the peace of our risen Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us take a moment now to offer with those around us some sign of Christ's peace, an embrace and a handshake. In just a few moments, there'll be the opportunity for those of you who are Catholic and receive the uh, communion before in the Catholic Church to come forward and receive the bread of life. I'll be right down here front and center, and I invite you to come out of your pews, maybe in two rows and up the center here and return by the side aisles. That should keep us from bumping into each other too much. Um, if you're not Catholic or have not received communion before in the Catholic Church, when those who are receiving communion come forward, I invite you to do one of two things, whichever you're most comfortable with. The first is, even if you're not receiving communion today, I invite you to come forward in the procession, but with your hands on your shoulders like this. If you come forward like this, I'll know that for whatever reason you're not receiving communion, and we'll be very happy to give you a special blessing on this important day in your life. Um, the other option, if that doesn't work for you, while folks are coming forward for communion or a blessing, you can simply be seated. The music we'll be singing is in the worship aid you have with Juliana's picture on the cover. Um, and you can simply continue to hold Juliana and each other in prayer on this beautiful morning. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the risen one who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. 
Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Just you. 
Grant, we pray, O Lord, that your servant Juliana, for whom we have celebrated this Paschal Sacrament, may pass over to a dwelling place of light and peace through Christ our Lord. Amen. At this time, I invite Rob to come forward to share a few words with us. Father Mark started at the beginning by asking us to remember something about um, my mom. And this isn't part of my eulogy, but I'm, I'm just complying with your request. Um, you said to try to remember something about her, and then you mentioned her accent. And I have to, it, it always surprises me because uh, you know that my parents were born in Hungary, and I grew up, uh, my first language was actually Hungarian, and my English is my second language. And for years, I just didn't know that they had an accent. And when I was a teenager, uh, one of my friends came up, and they said, hey, what is your parents' accent? And I said, what are you talking about? And then uh, they said, well, she can't, you know, you're, like your mom doesn't say the letter W, you know? And then it occurred to me that, oh my, yeah, actually that's right. She has an accent. So I was a teenager and I went up to my mom and, and I said, hey mom, have you seen my wallet? <laughs> maybe I left it in Washington or maybe it's in the washing machine. <laughs> And my mom says, Roby, which in Hungarian translates to, don't be a smart ass, I'm going to slap you so hard that you're going to stand on your head. <laughs> That's my memory. <laughs> I'd like to thank all of you all of you for being here. Thank you so much for coming to pay your respects and your love to my mom, uh, to be here to support me, to be here to support my family, and, uh, and, and uh, to celebrate her life. Um, and I believe uh, one of the signs of how my, mom, my mom's life touched so many people is just simply because of, because of the wonderful work of Michael Harmon, whose video production and webcast makes this possible, um, I believe that the webcast is being viewed uh, right now in, uh, here in California, in Montreal, Canada, uh, Toronto, uh, in Scottsdale, Arizona, in Budapest, Hungary, and in Sydney, Australia. So. Uh, that by itself is a is a sign of her uh, of her uh, reach. So I'd like to say thank you, merci beaucoup. Ich bin bin denking madrul sagon is kusenem sepen. Five months ago, October 23rd, I got a call at 2:30 in the morning. He said, your mom is being taken to the hospital. She has high blood pressure, respiratory issues, blood infection. And I flew back to the Bay Area, and I walked into Valley Care. And she's uh, in the emergency room, and she's surrounded by doctors and nurses. And she has IV tubes, and, and there's machines all around her, and they're beeping. And, and she, looked, she looked, at best, uncomfortable and at worst, miserable. So I was looking at this scene, and, and I'm thinking, well, what do I say? What, what can I say that is going to make this any better, any better for her? So I reached, I reached deep, and I found the perfect words. And I said, Mom, 
You are so high maintenance. <laughs> so the medical staff all looked up and were utterly shocked. And the only sounds in the room were the beeping of the machines and, and my mom laughing nonstop <laughs> at the sheer absurdity of her son. You know, last week, Father Mark said, never waste a good crisis. I was thinking about that all week. He said, you know, whenever you have adversity, you never, never waste a good crisis. So the, that joke, Mom, you're so high maintenance, is an old joke. I've, I've said it for many to her for many, many years, but the secret to the humor is to wait for the right moment. You have to wait for the scene and the situation to be so completely absurd. That's when you say it. And this medical crisis seemed to be the right time to say it. So sure enough, she laughed at the old joke. Uh, her blood pressure went down. Uh, her heart rate went down. And uh, I went and held her hand. And that was the best thing I could think of at the time. Um, I would spend the next five months uh, after October 23rd basically um, taking care of her. So I stopped everything. I stopped traveling. I stopped doing most activities. And I just, uh, I just took care of my mom and went to see her every day. And people would say, Rob, that's got to be so hard on you. It's got to be so hard on you. Well, it turns out that God works in mysterious ways. It turns out the five months was a blessing. It was wonderful. I got to slow down. I got to meet wonderful new people. All the people here from Creekview, and Patrick, and Vivian, Jim Price, all of these people, you know, are just people I just never really knew before and just got to know and, and make them better. And then I also got to spend five months with my mom and, and became much closer and tighter with her. And I wouldn't trade it for the world. It was, it was wonderful. I think if you read my mom's obituary, you know that you know, everybody likes to say that their mom lived a remarkable life. And, and I believe that my mom lived an extraordinary life by, by any measure, by any measure. She was born March 17, 1937. She wasn't three years old when Hungary was occupied by Nazi Germany. World War II started, Budapest was bombed by Allied bombers. Um, at the end of the war, Budapest and Hungary was occupied by the Soviet Union, became a communist puppet state. My mom and dad lived with very little freedom in that. And in 1956, the Hungarians revolted. My mom and dad's best friend, Robert Bonn, was fighting actively in the revolution. He was captured by Soviet soldiers and executed. And Robert Bonn was his name, and I was named after him later when I was born. My mom and dad escaped from Budapest. They got on a train that went close to the border. And at the train stations, Russians were waiting with machine guns because they, cl they closed the borders. They didn't want Hungary emptying. Um, so the train slowed down, the passengers bribed the conductor and the train slowed down enough so that people could jump off. Um, my parents jumped off the train, they went for the border, they were captured by Soviet soldiers, they bribed them, gave them their jewelry, they were let go, they were, they were able to cross the border. They went to Vienna, they were married in Vienna, the United States and Canada were running refugee planes and they got on a refugee plane to Canada, and I was born in Canada. And one of the first images I have, it's in the photo show that I showed last night at the vigil, and if you come over to our house afterwards for the reception, you can see it. It's, uh, it's Christmas of 1963. My mom is 26. I'm one. And uh, she's holding my hand uh, to help me stand. Uh, which is what she's been doing for me uh, my whole life. So I love that picture. Um, my mom was a housewife, and, and then she started going to night school. She was raising my brother and I. She went to night school for years and years and got a bachelor's in math 
She went to night school for more years, got a master's in math, went to night school for more years, and got a doctorate in mathematics education. She became an accomplished teacher. She was an advocate for girls in science and math. Nothing would make her more upset than when parents would come in and say, I don't know how you can expect my daughter to do well in math. She's a girl. So that would certainly set her off. Right? Um, lots of things happened. It's impossible to cover everything, but in 1992, she received a presidential award from President Bush in the Rose Garden in the White House, and she received numerous other awards over that. Now, I want to, you know, I want to tell you, you know, all of those are just almost, it, it almost surreal to look at a life like that and try to grasp you know, what does it mean? But I can tell you what it, it meant to me, okay? For someone to come live through a life like that, just, just imagine whatever problem you have just seems to feel less, and it just seems to become less. When you realize that somebody could live through that type of life, and then imagine all of the small things. She doesn't speak the language. She's in a strange country. She doesn't understand anything. They don't have any friends or, you know, it's... And then on top of it, to achieve everything she did, it taught me that you can overcome just about any adversity and never waste a good crisis, as Father Mark would say, All right? And she went on to accomplish so many things. And she gave me the gift of music. Um, I just can't believe how great you guys sound <laughs> this morning. Just, just, if it wasn't my funeral, I would have cried at the Ave Maria. It, it, it just, it was just beautiful. Just. So my mom pushed me to play piano when I was young, when I didn't want to. I didn't want to practice. No, not every day, but she pushed me because I was talented. And she pushed me, and, and there were a lot of times when I resented her. I resented her for not letting me go outside and not letting me do what I want to do. And in essence, she, she loved me so much that she was willing to be unpopular with me, which is an extra level of love that I think a parent can show to their children. Um, even in the last five months, she was teaching me. Um, so as her mind slipped, um, she reverted back to Hungarian. So I would ask her questions in English and she wouldn't understand it. And so if I asked her in Hungarian, then she would answer. So uh, my Hungarian got better. <laughs> so even without trying, she, was, she taught me to, uh, to uh, she, she taught me to bring my Hungarian back. Um, I, I brought the iPad in every Sunday morning, and thanks to Michael, um, we were able to watch Father Mark's inspired homilies and masses, and uh, she taught me to rekindle my faith in, in the Catholic Church. Um, so, above all, I think, you know, I got, I'm just grateful for that. And I'm just grateful for all of the wonderful people that I met um, in the five months. I already mentioned the people at Creekview, but people like Cheryl Hodep, who would bring us communion every Sunday morning. Um, Michael Harmon, who, who runs this. I've, I've said his name a bunch of times. I'm sorry, I just keep embarrassing you. Um, and and all, of the, all of the wonderful things. You know, I want to thank all of those people. I'd like to thank my wife, Mary, who took care of me and our dog, Tommy, during this time, uh, to my children who traveled to visit uh, Grandma multiple times and hold her hand before she passed, uh, to my wonderful sister-in-law, Lillian, who cared for my mom, went to see her every week for years and years. Um, Lillian is uh, my deceased brother's um, widow and uh, my sister-in-law. So thank you so much.
for taking care of my mom. So, and to my devoted, very devoted nephew, Eric, also um, for your, your constant devotion to my mom. All right. My mom was not perfect, um, but I, le I believe my mom's greatest accomplishments were to take words like love, forgiveness, faith, hope, joy, and demonstrate them in real tangible ways that I could learn from. And in the process of doing that, to urge me and my family to pay it forward to others which I think is the best, noblest thing for us to do. She also decided to help me by dying during Holy Week, right before Easter, so that I could, I could confront my own crisis in faith of whether or not there's life after death. And, and in the process of doing that, um, I, I got to hear Father Mark give just one of the most inspired homilies ever on Easter Sunday, and he just seemed to be talking solely for me, talking about what to take from Christ's death, resurrection, and eternal life. And, and today's homily was just as impactful. I'm almost done, sorry. <laughs> it's going so long. Um, when I was cleaning out my mom's apartment, I found a small prayer uh, framed and mounted on the wall. It was uh, St. Francis of Assisi's Peace Prayer. All right, it's an oldie but a goodie. Um, and, and I, but I just, I kind of looked at it in the context of my mother's life. And it, it's probably better than anything I can think of to just, you know, communicate that idea of how you want to live your life, and then pay it forward to others. So if it's okay with you, I'd like, to, I'd like to read it for you. All right, it's in the prayer cards. I don't know if they're here. I don't know if the prayer cards are here about it. But I think, I think we have them, okay? If we have them, take, t take it home. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there's injury, pardon. Where there's doubt, faith. Where there's despair, hope. Where there's darkness, light. Where there's sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in it is in dying that we are born born to eternal life. Amen. Thank you, Rob. I think I did see those prayer cards on the tables where you came in and signed the guest book, so please pick one of those up if you'd like to on the way out. And as Rob mentioned, there's a reception to find the conclusion of our service in a few moments at his home. So please come and continue to share stories and memories and be there for one another. Um, if you haven't figured it out yet, in the Catholic Church, we use all kinds of things to put us in touch with the mystery of our relationship with God, which can sometimes be really hard to perceive. And so we use things like really big candles we use bread, we use wine, you know, a couple weeks ago we used palms, on Ash Wednesday we used ashes, we use oil, we use just vestments, all sorts of things to help make it real because we take all of our senses very seriously. 
Uh, one of the symbols we're going to use now is one of my very favorites, and that's the symbol of incense. And it has such meaning to it. Um, so often in the scriptures, God speaks to his people. A voice comes from a cloud. And so the cloud of incense reminds us that God is present speaking to us today. Um, its sweet smell is of a life that was pleasing to God. And of course, the smoke rises upward as we like to imagine our prayers rise upward to God. But perhaps most significantly is that in the scriptures, things that were sacred and holy were reverenced by the use of incense. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of our Mass that at her baptism, the Holy Spirit came to dwell within Juliana. You may have heard the phrase, Temple of the Holy Spirit. She was a temple of the Holy Spirit. So she was sacred, and she was holy, and we honor that today. Trusting in God, we have prayed together for Juliana, and now we come to our last farewell. There is great sadness in parting, but we take comfort in the hope that one day we will see her again and enjoy her friendship. Although we will disperse in sorrow, the mercy of God will gather us together again in the joy of his kingdom. Therefore, let us always console one another with faith in the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Into your hands, Father of mercies, we commend our sister Juliana. In the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, she will rise with him on the last day. We give you thanks for the many blessings which you bestowed upon her in this life. They are signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, Turn toward us and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your servant and help us who remain to comfort one another with assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ and are with you and with our sister forever through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Eternal rest grant unto her, O Lord, may that perpetual light, light shine, shine upon her. her. May she rest in peace. May her soul and the souls of all the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. And may the blessed Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon all of us and remain with us forever. Amen. Amen. The Mass is ended. Let us go in peace and confidence in the resurrection, living lives to glorify God. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
Thank you.